thank you very much everybody for joining us today. Um, thank you, good morning and welcome to this UK Squirrelhood update on the fertility control research on grey squirrel fertility control uh, being carried out by researchers at the Animal and Plant Health Agency. Um, we have the fantastic team here today to present on progress so far, uh, where we're heading and to answer any burning questions you may have on this important work at the midpoint of our five year project. Um, just want to say thank you so much to everyone uh, that has donated to us to the fertility control project so far. Um, the UK Squirrel Accords Partnership's aim was to raise a million pounds to fund this five year project to develop a grey squirrel or contraceptive and species specific delivery mechanism, which will help to protect our red squirrels and broadleaf trees. Um, we still we still need uh, about 200,000 to complete the research and we welcome any and all donations, but we want to thank everybody who has contributed so far you have made this possible, thank you. And so I will hand over to the team. And first up, we have Giovanna Masai. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Giovanna Masai, uh, and I'm leading a team of researchers that are working on a project uh, with the title Delivering and Developing Oral Contraceptives for Gray Squirrels. Now, Thank you very much for being here first. I am quite aware that the majority of you would have heard about this project and would have seen part of this project. And the idea today is to summarize what has happened, as Kay said, for the first two and a half years. Um, and then, so I'll give you an, an introduction to the overall project. Then three of my colleagues will talk about the specifics and we will finish with wrapping up of where this is taking us. So bear with us and we'll take you uh, through the story of this project and, and the results. And I would like to echo also Kay's words in thanking everybody that donated to this work. We couldn't have done it without you. And what I'm hoping to do now in this introduction is to illustrate the complexity of this work, just in case somebody asks, why do we need a million? Uh, because the, the project, this is the most complicated project I've ever worked in my life. And I worked for a long, long time on this. And uh, it's particularly exciting though, because of the results that we've had. And just in case somebody, there are some throwing off remarks with people saying, well, we, we find the pill, we put the squirrels on the pill, that's it. So this is the illustration on how it's a bit more complicated at putting squirrels on the pill. So next slide, please. Okay, the project <coughs> at the glance is, as you know, it's a five-year project. It might become a six-year project because COVID slowed us down a little bit. Um, ideally, one million pound, and we developed it uh, along three strands. The first one is developing an oral contraceptive for squirrels. Uh, so, an oral contraceptive suitable for gray squirrels. The second strand is delivering the contraceptive to gray squirrel through a species specific bait delivering and monitoring system. And then the third strand is the modeling side, the model, the impact of population control methods. The squirrel project team uh, is about 17 staff, six organizations, uh, mainly in the UK, but also in the US and in France. Next slide, please. So the work plan as we designed it, uh, at the beginning of the project was along five years. Uh, we would start with uh, laboratory trials uh, with rats, laboratory rats used as a model species to test oral contraceptive. And this was based on some very successful um, outcome that we had had from previous trials on the oral contraceptive. Then we would uh, follow through to monitor beta 
picked by squirrels, by gray squirrels in the lab and in the field. Uh, laboratory trials with gray squirrels, optimized bait uptake, we'll talk a lot about this. Uh, then moved to the field with some uh, trials uh, to, uh, with squirrels to confirm the efficacy, the safety, and the efficacy at population level. And finally, in the final year, large scale trials to monitor the effect at population level and uh, initiate trials for the registration package. Next slide, please. So in terms of challenges, uh, challenges, and uh, I, I hope you will appreciate through these slides and through the talks of my colleagues, which were the challenges and, and also are working finding the solutions. In terms of development, we needed to identify a potential drug, um, and you will hear Bex Pinkham talk, talking about how we went through ups and downs. We were very confident at the beginning, then uh, we were not confident anymore for various reasons, and now we are back on track, definitely back on track with some drugs that we believe have a strong potential. But besides identifying a drug, so an oral contraceptive that worked on squirrels, and initially, obviously, on laboratory rats, we need to test the effect and the safety. We need to assess the longevity, uh, how many doses, and what is the frequency of doses that you give to an animal to make it infertile for a number of months or years. We had to proceed from uh, using the model species, the laboratory rats, and then tested what we found for the laboratory rats, also held through for the target species, the squirrel. And that's why we built a captive colony of gray squirrels to test the first hand and in control conditions, the effect of contraceptives, of oral contraceptives on gray squirrels in captivity. And then we also had to test the effect of the bait on the contraceptive because depending on what you put the contraceptive in, so the bait that will eventually contain the contraceptive, the, the properties and the efficacy of the contraceptive might change. So for all of these, uh, Bex uh, Pinkham uh, will give us the first talk on what are the results so far in the lab. The next uh, series of challenges that we had uh, will be illustrated by Sarah Beedham. So, and this is something that, again, not many people appreciate. I keep saying that even if we had an oral contraceptive ready, registered tomorrow, and effective on 100% of the animals, how would we go about delivering it to 3 million gray squirrels? And if you think about it, that's a very, very big question and a very, very big ask. So Sarah will talk about how we design feeders uh, to deliver the bait that will contain the contraceptive, how we assess the local squirrel numbers. That's important because we need to know whether we're having an impact at population level, how we tested bait uptake, again, with, with the bait that will contain the contraceptive for individual, from individual animals, how much does a squirrel eat every day, uh, particularly of the bait that will contain the contraceptive, and at population level, can we reach the target uh, proportion of a population to make a difference through fertility control? Sarah will also talk about the factors affecting bait uptake, the field trials that we uh, did, uh, many of these with volunteers. So this is an occasion for us to say big thank yous to all the volunteers that have participated so far in these trials and how we measure the effort to deliver the contraceptive. And then finally, uh, my colleague Simon Croft will talk about the modeling. The modeling, if you want, for lack of a better word, is the way we can use to think big. So we can compare uh, the fertility control versus culling. And although modeling is essentially mathematical equations, the good news is that these equations are based <laughs> on empirical data that we collected thanks to this project. 
So the data that we gave to Simon are data collected in the field. They're not uh, something that we dreamed about. And so Simon could uh, will illustrate his work at landscape scale uh, and uh, under different, different scenarios, what the modeling uh, will be doing also is looking at how long will it take for fertility control or culling or fertility control and culling integrated to bring down significantly a population or to eradicate a population of square roots. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is my last introductory slide for those that haven't seen this already. There was a very interesting um, report that then became a paper also by Forest Research on the social acceptability and methods used to manage squirrels in the UK. They had about 4,000 responders and more than 60% rated contraception as either acceptable or highly acceptable. And less than 20% rated warfaring as acceptable. The reason we have this slide up over and over is that, and, and through our work with volunteers, we have found multiple times that whilst there are many, many people out there that are very willing to, to help reduce the number of squirrels by putting out some bait that contains contraceptive, there are fewer and fewer people that are happy to kill in, in simple terms. So we believe that the social acceptability of um, oral conception would also drive this. And my last point is that we don't have a choice. We clearly culling for, for several reasons is not working enough. Otherwise the gray squirrels would have not increased. So we need other solutions and we are very, very grateful to all the organizations under the UK Squirrel Accord to give us the possibility of finding these solutions. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you very much Giovanna. Um, and just to say that thank you very much to everybody that has already sent in questions uh, for today's session. Um, I've put those together and collated them and some of those will be answered by the presentations but we'll pick some of them up at the end. Um, if you have any more questions, please can you put them in the Q&A section of the Zoom uh, webinar and use, you, but feel free to use the chat function to speak uh, amongst yourselves and I will keep an eye on that. But um, for any burning questions for the team, can, if you can put them in the Q&A, thank you very much. And we will move on to Bex. Hi, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to give a quick update on the development side of the project and the progress that we've been making in the last project year on actually making the oral contraceptives and the options that we've, we've got moving forward. So first up um, is just a quick biology lesson. Um, so in mammals, the reproductive system is primarily controlled by the hypothalamus. Um, this monitors and causes the release of hormones for reproduction. And importantly, the hypothalamus produces the gonadotrophin releasing hormone to the anterior pituitary. Now, this stimulates a whole cascade of reproductive hormones in both males and females in all mammals. So when we think about contraceptive, if we disrupt all or part of this process, this can cause infertility. So if we cancel the action of the GnRH um, at the top, for example, we will prevent the whole cascade of reproductive hormones and this can effectively shut down the whole reproductive system. Alternatively, we can think about targeting lower down in the system and cancelling the production of more specific reproductive hormones such as testosterone or the female hormones. So this is a sort of idea of the areas that we might be targeting when we're looking at a contraceptive. Now, um, there are injectable contraceptives available. Um, so these injectable immunocontraceptives create antibodies against proteins or hormones that are essential for reproductions. These stimulate the immune system and in fact, it, it cause infertility. Now we've been working on projects with these injectable contraceptives for many years now, and they've been proven to work well on many species such as deer and wild boar. We can measure the success of these contraceptives by reproductive output and also the presence of specific antibodies caused by the vaccines. Now, however, 
Injectable formulations are not ideal. Animals need to be captured for treatment, and particularly when we're thinking about squirrels, especially at a landscape scale, this kind of capture and treatment is just not feasible. In squirrels case especially, um, it's not possible to catch and release grey squirrels under the invasive species legislation. So what we need to do is find an oral solution. So previously we've been working on, on oral contraceptive formulations and we've had some good results. Um, in some previous formulations we found that we could induce antibody titers in 60% of rats that were dosed orally and all of the rats with titers did not breed. However, this 60% isn't quite ideal um, and we still want to increase the efficacy of the vaccine to reach a high response and achieve infertility at the population scale. So what we've been doing is looking at three different candidate oral contraceptives, um, three different avenues to try and improve on the results that we've had previously and find some candidate contraceptives for squirrels which are suitable for oral delivery. Now our first option was to load an oral vaccine into bilosomes. Now, bilosomes are uh, sort of capsules made up of cell layers. And importantly, they include bile salts in these cell layers. Now, what the bile salts do is help to protect from the stuff stomach acids and deliver the vaccine to the gut, which is one of the main problems with oral contraceptives. Obviously, their digestive system is quite rough um, and it can degrade the vaccine as it goes through. So these bilosomes are a way of trying to protect the vaccine um, and increase the uptake down at the gut and hopefully the bilosomes have properties which are um, help to stimulate the immune system and boost the immune response. Now results from this formulation we tested three different variations in male rats and we measured the testosterone levels and the immune response to the vaccine post-treatment. Now we had some um, encouraging initial results where we saw a reduction in testosterone um, with the average testosterone levels in serum samples um, across all the different formulations there. And we saw a reduction in testosterone compared to the pre-treatment levels, which was a good initial result. And then we also looked at immune response. Um, this was also very encouraging because we had all treated rats had an immune response to the, to the vaccine itself. So all of our, our treated rats had an antibody titer. Um, but when we looked at the titer levels, um, we found that the, the actual scale of the response wasn't quite strong enough to what we expect causes infertility. So moving forward with this vaccine, um, we would need to try and uh, make a stronger immune response to reach the levels needed for infertility. Now, our second contraceptive was a novel oral vaccine. Um, so we, this is the second avenue we explored. It was a completely novel formulation. And we tested two variations of this formulation in female rats. And this was a very exciting result that we got from this contraceptive. Um, I'll go into some more of the specific details at a later date. Um, we can't release all of the details about this one just yet, but um, these results were very, very exciting. Um, we, like before, we had all of the rats responding to the oral treatment. And very importantly, when looking at the scale of the immune response, we had a fantastic result, particularly in formulation two, where 80% of our rats showed an immune response that was very highly likely to indicate infertility, which is a massive step forward in this project with an oral delivery of a vaccine. And some very good news. Now, the third candidate was um, actually not a vaccine. So this is called diazocon, and it is a chemical that acts on cholesterol levels. It's a cholesterol inhibitor. Cholesterol itself is a precursor for reproductive hormones. It's part of the building blocks that go into making reproductive hormones in males and females. So what diazocon does, it's a cholesterol mimic that's structurally almost identical cholesterol. What diazocon does is it binds to the relevant enzymes in the system and prevents the production of cholesterol. By reducing your normal cholesterol levels in animals by over 40%, it's likely to cause infertility. So if you significantly reduce the cholesterol with diazocon, this should re re reduce the reproductive hormones themselves. Now, we tested diazocon in male squirrels. And unlike humans, squirrels are seasonal breeders and they have hormone cycles that follow two yearly peaks 
of, of hormones over their breeding periods. So males will have two peaks in testosterone, which coincide with the mating season. We mixed up diazocon in a bait and gave that to male squirrels and tracked their hormone levels over the time that we'd expect to see some hormone changes and their, their peaks in testosterone. So the results from this were also very encouraging. Um, if you see the graph there, we have testosterone up the y-axis and days post-treatment along the x-axis. We have the treated animals there in pink and the control animals there in blue. And we saw the control animals um, over the expected peak of testosterone. We had the rise and fall in testosterone over the breeding season and the treated animals, we had much lower levels of testosterone. Um, so this was very encouraging, um, but we did have a lot of high variation in the testosterone levels between the groups. And we also had some big differences in the bait uptake levels um, between individuals. So what we want to do moving forward um, would be to look at trying to increase the bait uptake levels. And next steps in general, um, what we want to do is try to test the long term effect of our a uh, really exciting novel oral vaccine formulation, which was candidate two. We want to look at the long-term effect of the vaccine on the immune response and also prove its link with fertility. And we want to move away from our model species in the rats and start to measure the immune response to oral vaccination in squirrels. And then the next thing we want to do is try to explore some different bait types and dose schedules for the formulation to try and maximize the efficacy and really get the formulation um, at a peak level. So, yeah. And thank you very much for listening. And a big thank you as well to all of our collaborators that have been working on the development of the formulation. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Bex. Uh, I think you can all agree that's very exciting uh, news and very exciting research being done. Uh, and now we'll pass over to Sarah, who has been working on the delivery side. Hi. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> I've just got a little bit of an echo at the moment. We'll sort out the tech. <laughs> um, so yes, I'm going to be talking about the research we've been doing on how we'll deliver the oral contraceptives to grey gray squirrels. So as Giovanna mentioned, this is particularly important to ensure we uh, deliver contraceptives to enough squirrels, but also to ensure we don't affect other animals when we're doing so. So if we look at the next slide. So, uh, this research is based on four key questions. So first of all, will the majority of schools eat a contraceptive in a natural environment? Uh, secondly, will individual schools eat enough contraceptive for it to be effective? The third question, can we ensure contraceptives will not affect other animals in a natural environment? And finally, can we estimate the effort required for successful contraceptive delivery? So if you look at the first question, uh, will the majority of squirrels eat a contraceptive? To assess this, we used um, a bait marker to simulate the delivery of a contraceptive in woodlands. So the way we did this is we delivered the bait marker, which was mixed in hazelnut paste, and we fed it to squirrels via squirrel bait hoppers for four days. So you can see the picture of one of our hoppers. So it's a metal tube, and a bait compartment, which is accessed by opening a 70 gram door. And we put these out in woodlands, uh, as I said, for four days. And then the following week, we trapped and dispatched squirrels until the majority were removed from the wood, if not all. And then we took hair samples from the squirrels and analyzed them for presence of the bait marker. So the picture on the right, you can see this is a squirrel that's eaten the bait marker and it causes the hair to, to fluoresce under UV light so you can see who's taken the bait. So if you look to the next slide, um, these are the results from 10 woods that we've done this uh, study in so far. So if you look at the column on the right hand side, it shows the percentage of squirrels in each wood that actually consumed the bait. Um, so you can see that six out of 10 woods, uh, we got over half of the school populations actually consuming the bait, which is very encouraging. Uh, particularly encouraging is uh, wood number nine, as this was entirely uh, delivered through volunteers, uh, and we still achieved a rate of 
over 70%. So we looked at different factors and how they affected beta uptake. And by far the most important factor was season. So uh, beta uptake, which was much better in summer compared to winter. Um, also uh, using three hoppers per hectare was much better than one. Um, and this is probably because when you use three hoppers per hectare, the ratio of schools to hoppers is typically less than two. So there's enough access to hoppers for the squirrels. So as you can see at the bottom, we have two uh, poor results in terms of beta uptake. Uh, so if you look at the next slide, we can discuss this a bit more. So the wood with the worst beta uptake uh, was done in winter uh, with one hopper per hectare. But as you can see also, the squirrel density was exceptionally high. So there's, there was 15 squirrels um, per hectare, and this is uh, unusually high for this type of environment. So it's just a, a coniferous woodland. Um, additionally, there was a lot of natural food in that woodland as well. Um, if we look at wood 10, uh, this was a bit more of a surprising result as it was done in summer with three hops per hectare and the squirrel density wasn't overly high. And yet we only got 19% taking the bait. So we've used this as a lessons learned exercise and we have a few ideas of how we can maximize bait uptake. So that in that wood, we had evidence, as you can see from the photograph, that squirrels had a lot of natural food available to them. So there's a squirrel eating um, a maize kernel from a local farmer's field. So uh, while well sat on our hoppers, so that didn't help with the bait uptake. Uh, additionally, we had evidence that some minor modifications we made to the hoppers may have affected uh, how the squirrels could access them and it might have deterred them slightly. We also had evidence that the bait marker itself may become unpalatable because of the humid conditions in that wood. And finally, uh, we were also looking at how we can redefine the hopper distribution throughout woods to ensure the majority of squirrels have better access to the bait. So if we look at the next slide. So our second question is, uh, will individual squirrels eat enough contraceptive? Um, so at some of the woods where we delivered the bait marker, we also went in first and trapped and microchipped as many squirrels as possible. Uh, we then deployed our modified hoppers at a density of three per hectare. So if you see the photograph on the bottom right, our modified hoppers have a microchip reader. So we know the date and time uh, that each individual micro, microchip squirrel actually accesses the bait. They also, at a later date, incorporated a bait weighing device that allowed us to uh, measure how much bait each individual squirrel was taking. Um, so we use these to, as I said, record the number of feeding visits and also the amount of bait consumed by individual squirrels. Uh, so if we look at the next slide. Uh, so initially we went into two woods in winter and we microchipped 51 squirrels. Uh, we deployed 24 hoppers per wood. And throughout the bait trial, which included one week of pre-bait and four days of bait marker, uh, we had 47 of these squirrels entering the hoppers. Now we have evidence that uh, at least one of the squirrels that didn't enter the hoppers actually had lost its microchip, so we don't know if it went in or not. Um, and the others, we don't know whether they just simply wouldn't enter the hoppers or whether they had actually left the area. But what we can say using the graph below, we can see that uh, this shows the number of visits to hoppers through the microchip records um, and the number of schools who made those number of visits up the side. And we can see that for both males and females, the majority of schools made over 80 visits to hoppers in just four days. So this is very encouraging in terms of the contraceptive, because with a vaccine, we may require multiple doses, so we can be sure that uh, the schools will have an adequate amount. Uh, we repeated the trial, sorry, <laughs> uh, we repeated the trial in summer, but uh, unfortunately, this was at the wood where we only achieved 19% bait uptake. 
So we currently don't have sufficient uh, realistic feeding behavior data to look at that. What we were able to say though, is for the few animals that did visit hoppers regularly, they, eat, they basically ate the bait little and often. So they took less than one gram per visit, but they did it frequently throughout the day. And this means that we could actually manage the delivery of the contraceptive more effective because more effectively as we won't get individual squirrels sitting at hoppers eating lots and lots of bait. Uh, so the next slide. Uh, so the third question was, uh, can we ensure contraceptives will not affect other animals? So the contraceptive vaccines we're looking at uh, should only affect mammals, uh, while diazicon may affect both birds and mammals. Uh, so as I mentioned, our bait is currently protected by a metal tube with a 70 gram door, um, and the hoppers are placed on one meter high wooden stands in woodlands. Um, each hopper records the date and time when the door is opened by a magnetic switch. And this tells us when the bait is accessed and we know who has accessed it through monitoring with a remote camera. So if you look at the next slide. So this is just a few examples of the photographs we've seen of, of non-target animals uh, around our hoppers. Now the vast majority of animals have no interest in the hoppers at all. In fact, they're more interested in just standing on the wooden stands we put them on. Uh, we have had the odd photograph of badgers giving the hoppers a sniff, but none of them have actually attempted to access them. In fact, the only animals we've actually photographed inside the hopper entrances are small birds such as tits and mice. Uh, but if we look at the next slide, we can see the results of our camera data. So this table just shows uh, the results of the cameras that we put out on hoppers where we delivered the bait marker. Um, so we can see with 99 cameras in total, we got uh, around 100,000 images of animals were hoppers, but the vast majority of those images were actually just of squirrels. Uh, the few pictures we have got of other animals Animals you can see included hare, rabbits, small birds, uh, roe deer, uh, rat, mice, um, tawny owls, badgers, and a couple of domestic uh, cats and dogs. But we know uh, from the door data that none of these animals actually managed to access the bait. And in fact, in our 10 field trials so far, and on only one occasion have we had evidence that a non target a mouse actually managed to get into the hopper bait compartment. So if you look at the next slide, uh, we also monitor the, the bait spillage from around the hoppers. So uh, the squirrels tend to eat the bait there and then, and as I said, little and often. Uh, the bait marker is bright pink, so we can easily detect spillage. And uh, on the vast majority of occasions, there's very minimal spillage. And when there is, it's less, typically less than a gram. Uh, so if we look at the next slide. Um, so we're looking at uh, further refinements uh, to prevent access by non-target. So when we actually have a contraceptive in our feeders, we will have to make the bait more secure. So we'll put heavy weights on the doors to ensure smaller mammals cannot access it. Uh, the hoppers will be likely to be located higher up, so in trees. Uh, to prevent human interference, we'd also have a locked bait compartment and uh, have clearly labelled hoppers. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. Um, so one thing we are interested in is to have the ability of putting hoppers out contraceptive in areas where there's both red and grey squirrel, squirrels to help red squirrel recovery. So we have a trial plan this year just to test uh, how we can exclude red squirrels, first using weighted doors, but also we're also going to look at the potential of using colour sensors as an additional selective tool. Uh, so next slide. Um, so our final question is, can we estimate the effort required for successful delivery of the contraceptive? So Simon will be talking about how we can est estimate the effort required uh, on a large regional scale, 
but for this question I was looking at uh, in, in woodlands localized, on a localised scale. And by efforts, I mean number of hoppers and amount of time spent putting those hoppers out. So in order to do this, we estimated the amount of squirrels, the density of squirrels in each wood using camera traps before we put the hoppers in the woods. So we put out cameras at one per hectare and baited them for at least four days. We then calculated an index based on the, on the number of photos uh, of squirrels per camera per day. And then finally, the squirrels, uh, as with all of our studies on bait markers, were trapped and dispatched until the majority of squirrels were removed from each woodland. And this gave us a good estimate of the population from which to compare the camera index. So if you look at the next slide. So the graph below, uh, as you can see, this is the calculated density index uh, from the cameras. And up the side is the density scores removed from nine woods. And we can see the results from nine woods show a very strong relationship between the two values. And this means that we can accurately predict the number of squirrels in woods using cameras. Uh, for example, in one wood delivered by, the, with the method delivered by volunteers, we initially estimated there were 69 squirrels in the wood and they subsequently trapped 76. Um, there was only one wood that did not fit nicely into this uh, graph and that was the one with the exceptionally high density of squirrels. So there's over 14 squirrels per camera and there's just too many squirrels for it to adequately estimate uh, the number there. Uh, but we're refining it and uh, the method, and we're currently developing it into a practical tool for volunteers and practitioners to use. So the next slide. Uh, so if we look at our key questions, so will the majority of schools eat a contraceptive? Uh, from our data, we know that yes, they will, as long as there are enough hoppers per squirrel. Uh, secondly, will individual squirrels eat enough contraceptive? Uh, we feel this is highly like it, likely from the data we've gathered. So squirrels will receive repeat doses over time. Uh, and we need to uh, ascertain how much is enough contraceptive from captive trials using our contraceptors first. Uh, can we ensure contraceptives will not affect other animals? So our data so far shows that hoppers will exclude most animals already, but we need to refine them for red squirrels and look at additional non-targets uh, such as pie martens. And finally, can we estimate the effort required for successful delivery of the contraceptive? Um, so yes, we can reliably measure density of squirrels in most woodlands, um, which will tell us how many hoppers would be needed for successful delivery of a contraceptive. Uh, so next slide. So I'd just like to thank the UK Squirrel Accord and all of the collaborators and the landowners and volunteers that contrib contributed to the study so far. Wonderful, thank you very much, Sarah. Yes, uh, species specificity is really important part of this project. Um, and now we will move on to Simon who will talk to us about the modelling. Thank you, Kay. So yeah, it would help if I uh, unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Are you happy and all set? I think so. Okay. You can hear me okay? Yes, that's great. Thanks, yeah. Simon. Okay. For some reason, I can't see myself on the video, but um, oh. technical issues, I think you're a... You look good. <laughs> All right. Brilliant. Well, <laughs> fantastic to know. Okay. Um, yeah. So for the last two and a half years, I've, I've been the, uh, the lead modeler on this project. Um, and I thought I'd start by um, outlining... So next slide. Sorry, okay. Thank you. Do you want to... You can just click through it if you like to, to bring up the different points. Thank you. Um, so I thought I'd just start by outlining um, why, a, um, why we've considered and built a model at this stage of the project. So first of all, um, it helps us to gather everything we already know in one place and combine it all to make um, useful insights, both um, that are relevant to the end of the project and, and also um, in the development as we go along. 
Um, it allows us and gives us a platform to test and compare different management options um, in identical conditions, which um, is hard to do in field work because obviously you can't um, apply different treatments to the same population necessarily. So um, it allows us uh, to do that on exactly the same population of squirrels and makes for better, um, easy comparisons. Um, as Sarah mentioned, it also allows us to perform these kind of um, experiments, these kind of comparisons over much larger um, scales beyond, with, beyond um, what would be practical for um, field work, certainly at this stage. And um, importantly, as new information becomes available, so as, as data comes in from the field work, um, it gives us, um, we can use that additional knowledge and provide feedback um, to the ongoing empirical work, so the contraceptive development and um, studies in the field. So next slide. Thank you. Yeah, again, you can click largely through. Um, so what we've developed is a spatially explicit individual based model, which sounds quite complicated. Um, but ultimately, um, what this means is that we um, define a landscape, in this case, uh, patches of woodland, um, and then aim to describe Describe um, the individual life histories of the squirrels that live in it. So as they're, they're born, as they mature, they reproduce, move around and eventually die. So we can move on to the next slide. Um, so back at the beginning of the project, um, we, are, we performed some, once we developed our model, um, we used it in an initial case. Um, to explore how fertility control might reduce squirrel populations. And um, using some initial uh, data from the field work, which suggested that um, three, ho uh, three hoppers per hectare deployed over the four days, we might be able to target 79% of a squirrel population. We looked at uh, the outcomes given different potential contraceptive efficacy. So that's um, once a squirrel has consumed um, the the contraceptive or bait, um, how lightly will that squirrel, uh, how lightly that squirrel is to become infertile. So this is shown in the plot that we have here, um, which details the, on the Y axis, we have a population of squirrels and then um, on the X axis, how that changes over time. Um, and we tested uh, different efficacies, 50%, uh, 75%, 90% and 100% efficacy. And what this shows was that given the 79% um, consumption rates that we, we had assumed from our data, that actually if we had a uh, contraceptive efficacy of 75% or greater, we were able to achieve eradication in what we considered to be a reasonable time, which in this case we set at 25 years. So combining the delivery and the contraception, this meant that um, we approximately we needed to maintain approximately 60% of squirrels as infertile. This is important because um, while we looked at a specific combination, it meant, for example, um, we could if we could achieve 100% delivery of the contraceptive, the efficacy of the contraceptive itself only needed to be 60% uh, uh, effective or vice versa. So um, if, for instance, um, we had 100% a perfect uh, contraceptive drug, then we would only need to deliver it to 60% of the population. Um, so this provided an important target for the, uh, for the future development. Um, so that was good, um, but what we really wanted to do was to um, understand as well how to deploy the contraceptive. And we needed to, to understand how varying things like hopper density and uh, also trap densities affect um, delivery or affect the management outcomes. So focusing on traps first, um, the, this plot um, outlines the efficacy of uh, trapping in trap days um, on the y-axis against decreasing numbers of squirrels. Um, and what we see is that as the number of squirrels reduces, so does the trap efficacy, um, which I think has been well documented. Basically, as, as squirrel populations decrease, um, on, on a particular day, we are less likely to, we will trap less squirrels. Um, and we actually found that we could reproduce this pattern um, with a, assuming a fixed probability 
of any specific squirrel, so an individual squirrel in our population, entering a specific trap on a given day at, uh, at a rate of 0.05. Um, and this probability was constant uh, regardless of the season or the year. So this was across all of the data that we collected. Um, but obviously when scaled up to the population levels present at different times, um, it still produced the overall effects on, on trapping efficacy that Sarah mentioned. So because of the changes in density in different seasons or in different years, we saw different efficacies which related to what we observed in the field. So moving on to the interaction with hoppers, we saw the same probability of a squirrel entering a hopper as traps um, among those squirrels that, that actually use the hoppers. But as Sarah's already shown, um, because we potentially because we weren't removing animals, um, the data showed that not all squirrels use the hoppers. And actually, um, when we investigated this data, um, perhaps it's not unsurprising, but uh, the proportion of squirrels using the hoppers was correlated with the, relation, the ratio of squirrels per hopper. So obviously the more hoppers we put out for per squirrel, um, the higher uptake or the higher um, num proportion of those squirrels were using the hoppers. And it's illustrated in the, in the plot shown here. Uh, so on the y-axis, we have the proportion that we managed to target um, with a deployment over four days um, and as measured um, using the road mean bait marker. And on the x-axis, we have the, um, the ratio of squirrels per hopper. And you can see as the, the number of squirrels per hopper increases um, towards the right, then the proportion that we managed to target, the proportion that was showing, showing up with the road mean bait um, reduces. So we were able to, again, we were able, oh, oops, sorry, uh, back one, okay, yeah, sorry. We were able to, um, again, we were able to, to predict or to model this relationship. Um, and you can see on the plot, so the blue dots are from data from the field trials and the orange dots are, are modeled data. So next slide. Thank you, Kay. Sorry, I've been forgetting to say next slide. You're doing a very good job of keeping up with me. Um, so we incorporated all of this into the into the model and uh, first turned our attention to looking at um, trapping with different trap densities now. Um, so we applied um, a simple deployment, but uh, we looked at uh, initially trapping across all woodlands um, for the recommended uh, five days, uh, nine months of the year. So 45 days in total and looked at different trap densities ranging from 0.125 traps per hectare all the way up to four traps per hectare. And what you can see from the plot, so on the left, um, we have the effects of um, the trapping on the population of squirrels uh, over time. Um, and you can see very rapid um, population reductions, even with um, quite low trap densities. Um, on the right though, um, what we also looked at was the time um, to eradication, so the, the time it took to remove the last squirrel um, from our simulations. And you can see um, quite long tails. So what we're expecting here, once all the squirrels had been removed in all of our simulations, we would have an eradication probability of one. Um, and you can see that it obviously increases over time, um, but it, it can take a very long time. And actually, um, what we saw is for 0.5 traps per hectare, which I believe is the average um, across the, the removal that, that was um, deployed in the, in the Anglesey large scale removal. Um, it took 15 years to remove the last squirrel, which I, I understand is uh, a comparable number. So obviously we looked at trapping as our comparison, but we wanted to again, look at fertility control um, and see what might happen. So for simplicity uh, in our comparison, we compared equal densities of hoppers as traps with the same deployment. Um, so 0 0.5, we, we chose 0 0.5 hoppers per hectare deliberately, um, again, to, to mimic the, the kind of uh, effort that might, we might see across a large scale um, deployment, large scale, uh, management effort um, and what this showed perhaps unsurprisingly so sorry what i should say is that 0 
hoppers per hectare you'll remember back from Sarah's talks is much lower than the three hoppers per hectare that we have um, been deploying in the field and we've shown that can um, previously shown that can effectively eradicate the same population in a reasonable time um, but perhaps unsurprisingly then at this um, at this high squirrel to hopper ratio fertility control turned out to be um, ineffective but we'll discuss later why densities of hoppers could be increased more easily than traps which um, hopefully will um, return us to the situation where we are able to use fertility control alone. So moving on, thank you, Kay. Um, but what we wanted to look at as well was uh, alternative methods, and uh, Giovanna mentioned this, that we, we looked at a sequential approach. So this was looking at what happened if we had one year of culling um, and then uh, to reduce populations and then deployed fertility control as an ongoing management tool. And again, we so we looked at simulations uh, under the same conditions with 0.5 traps and hoppers per hectare. And what you can see from the, the figures or the plots that we have here is that under the different conditions, um, again, there's, we achieve rapid population um, reduction from the culling, but, now with the um, low densities of squirrels and therefore relative higher um, squirrel to sorry lower squirrel to hopper ratio so more hoppers per squirrel um, actually we are able to um, maintain low populations and actually achieve eradication even with an imperfect contraceptive so as low as 75 percent um, the median time to eradication is uh, similar to that of culling itself. So why is this important? Well, I'll move on to my conclusions. So at, um, as I've said before, at 0.5 hoppers per hectare, um, the squirrel to hopper ratio is too high to achieve um, minimum 60% infertility that we'd previously determined. But um, initial trapping, this initial trapping to reduce squirrel densities obviously decreased the squirrel to hopper ratio such that we could actually maintain low densities and achieve eradication in similar time to trapping alone. So 10 to 15 years, hopefully. But the key thing to note is that um, traps need to be checked daily, more frequently by, by law. Um, hence, the sequential approach should require a lot less effort to deploy because um, we're estimating, because hoppers um, only need to be checked in order to replenish bait. We would estimate that that is at least um, five times less effort in maintaining the devices. So when you have obviously deployment for five days of traps, we're, what we're saying is that you should only have to check a hopper once. Obviously this less frequent maintenance means that hoppers uh, could be deployed at uh, the higher numbers of traps that are required to achieve sufficient to achieve um, eradication with fertility control alone, but with similar overall effort as trapping. So what are our next developments? Um, well, um, as you've heard, there are still ongoing um, developments with the, both the field work and with the, um, the contraceptive development. Um, so we will be obviously refining the model, continuing to refine the model to inform um, all of the to inform it of all these different developments and we'll continue to run the models. Um, until now, we've applied management or assumed management simultaneously across our landscape. Um, obviously, in reality, it's more complicated than this. Um, so we'll be refining the model to accommodate scheduling across woodlands on a on a finer time scale. So we're looking at doing this weekly. So, for instance, we can um, look at what happens if we deploy trapping in one woodland in one week and then another woodland the next week rather than at the same time. Similarly, our model hasn't accounted yet for local seasonal variation squirrel densities. So for instance, masting. Our hypothesis has always been that at the large scales we're looking at, um, these effects eventually average out and don't, actually, don't impact our recommendations for coordinated management. But we want to confirm this uh, is in fact the case and whether we need to consider more bespoke local action plans. So that's the end. Thank you very much for listening. Again, I apologise, Kay, for not saying next slide all the time. No, you're fine, Simon. It was all good. <laughs> Hopefully we all kept up with each other. <laughs> we both kept up with each other. Thanks very much, Simon.
Um, and now we're just back to Giovanna, hopefully, to just uh, round us off on the presentations. Hello, Giovanna. Okay, uh, Kay, can you hear me? Yes, I can, thank you. Can you hear me, Kay? Okay. Yes, yeah. Right. Okay, uh, so this is some conclusions drawn from all the presentations of my colleagues. I hope everybody is now appreciating the, the challenges, the solutions that we are trying to provide and the complexity of, of all of these. So next slide, please. So I have just a few slides to, to tell you more about where this is going. So for the development side of the oral conceptives, the highlights are that we do have now three candidates oral contraceptives for gray squirrels. Uh, and these are the bilosome based vaccine, the diazocon, uh, the diazocon as a cholesterol inhibitor and a novel vaccine. Now, the bilosome based vaccine, we feel it's, we, th there's no way we can take all three of these um, proposed contraceptives forward uh, because as, as you've heard, it's already complicated to work with one. So we are proposing to um, not work for, for the time being <clears throat> on the bilosomes because it's an early stage. We need more uh, research and development of this. That doesn't mean that we are discarding these but we might seek uh, other collaborators that might want to take this uh, forward. Uh, on the second one, there is a cholesterol inhibitor. We would call it a, no, back please. Yeah, we'd call this a medium stage. We still need some R&D as Bex was saying, uh, we need to increase the palatability of baits that contain diazocon for squirrels. Squirrels don't like the taste of diazocon. We can use uh, taste masking agents, so that's doable. But compared to our third contraceptive, which we presumably, uh, which we provisionally call a novel vaccine, uh, we feel that the novel vaccine is the most promising one. I do realize that calling it a novel vaccine and telling everybody believe us is working is not fantastic, is not perfect. The reason for, for being very cautious is not only that the data are preliminary, we, we thought that the data that Bex presented are very, very good, but we are now in the process of exploring the filing of a patent to protect this, uh, this work, to protect the intellectual property of this work. I'll tell you more about this in a second. And then the other highlight in this area is that we have established a captive Fire colony reported in of the gray squirrels. Please leave the building immediately by the nearest available exit. If everybody agrees, we should take two minutes pause because this is going on in the lab, we can't do anything. Oh okay. no, is it your please. fire alarm? May I have your attention, please? It's a, it's a test a fire for two minutes. In the building. Okay, if you just mute well, yourself, I'll put your mute, if you mute yourself. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we were going to take a 10 minute break um, following uh, Giovanna's um, uh, conclusions, but uh, I, I suggest Sorry. we take a 10, have we okay. finished? Is it finished? Okay. Yes. 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 Oh, okay. <laughs> it, was, it was just a test. Oh, oh right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, everybody. We, yeah, we, we, could, we, could, we couldn't stop that from happening. It was a test. So the last uh, part of the last comment of this, this slide is that we have established a captive colony of gray squirrels, test contraceptive. It took a long time to establish this colony. You wouldn't believe it, but squirrels are very difficult to breed in captivity. But we are there now. We have uh, at least a, a big a proportion of the squirrels that are either breeding or we have some proxy for um, showing that they, they have uh, reproductive behavior. And these will be our precious squirrels uh, when we go to test a contraceptive 
uh, in, in practice in control environment. Next one, please. Okay, so on the developing, where is this going? So by the end of year three, which is at the end of September, we are going to test the novel vaccine on a larger scale trial in rats. Uh, and uh, we'll test it in rats in terms of antibodies to the vaccine and in terms of uh, reproduction, reproductive output. But we'll also do a pilot trial in gray squirrels. By the end of year four, we would like to have tested different doses, uh, duration of effect, and then different types of bait, because as I was saying uh, in my introduction, the bait composition might potentially affect the effectiveness of the, of the contraceptive. So we need to be absolutely sure that this is not the case, coupled with the fact that our bait cannot be a solid bait, it has to be a semi-liquid or a paste bait uh, so that the squirrels don't take it away from the hopper. If you look at the bottom of the slide, uh, what we've done in the first three years is effectively provide a proof of concept of the fact that we do have a candidate oral contraceptive and, uh, we, and the contraceptive does what it was intended to do, which is preventing reproduction, but still whilst being safe to the animals and still uh, being, we, we are able, we have proven that we are able to deliver it to uh, most of the animals in the field. In year four and five, so starting from the end of the year forward, so the, the first uh, part, year one of three, and we'll continue to do so, is run under a home office license that regulates animal experiments in the UK. In year four and five, we'll continue to work under the home office license, but we will start to collect the data for the registration dossier. Um, so I was talking about a patent before. For those that don't know about this, uh, a patent protects the intellectual um, discovery, the, the intellectual side of, of a drug uh, that has been developed uh, as I have described before. However, you do nothing with a patent. Nobody does anything with a patent besides having the intellectual property protected. For, for it to become a reality, and I know that several people have asked, when can we have it, when will it be available? We need to find a manufacturer uh, that will produce the contraceptive under what in the industry is called good manufacturing practice. And good manufacturing practice means that uh, the regulators want to be absolutely sure about the purity of ingredients, the stability, the consistency of ba batches and so on, which is why producing uh, a new veterinary medicine is it takes years and, and may cost millions. But the way we are hoping to um, speed up this process is that if we start collecting the data for the, the registration dossier in year four and five, all the um, expense involved and, and the time involved into producing the registration dossier would be partly be offset uh, by us collecting the data as we go on. Uh, then for, to go to a registration dossier, we will have to give uh, more information about the safety and efficacy of the product, of the final product, which is why we need to know about doses, frequencies, and so on, um, and environmental fate. If it was diazacon, we will have to uh, prove that it does not go through the food chain and so on. So there are a number of other data that the regulators require to make this a, a reality and to go to the market. Uh, in terms of the manufacturer, the manufacturer, so the fact that we can produce some of this data for a manufacturer that will take it to market means that the, the proposal for a, a company or a manufacturer that wants to take it to market 
should be much more interesting because we have already offset some of the costs. And in terms of the cost of the contraceptive, that will depend on who takes this forward. And obviously on the scaling up of production, we are now producing these in our labs, which is definitely not cost effective, but is what we need for the research. So, and ideally we have to make it this cost effective, otherwise uh, there's not, no point in, in talking about it. And a manufacturer or a company that takes this forward will know this very well. Uh, there's an element, important element of this, um, because uh, the vaccine is likely to be effective on many mammals. It might be an interesting proposition for a company that wants to take it to market because the contraceptive could be registered for more than one species. So whilst the squirrel, the gray squirrel might con be considered a niche market, if you extend it to other species, that becomes much more interesting from, from a, a business point of view. Next slide, please. So delivering oral contraceptives, the highlights uh, from Sarah, we have developed a feeder that allowed us to monitor individual data take. Um, all the complicated feeder that Sarah was, was describing, we're certainly not thinking about microchipping squirrels routinely or using the microchip reader in routine operations. This was used as a research tool to, so that we could have an idea on the dose and the frequency of feeding from individual squirrels. We have successfully employed a bait marker to monitor population data take with good results. We have developed a gray squirrel density index based on camera traps. And I can emphasize enough how an achievement this is because although they as Sarah was describing, this is only so far limited to relatively small woodlands, and if there are far too many squirrels as in one of the woodlands that Sarah was talking about, that the index might not work. It doesn't happen generally that a, an index based on camera traps matches the actual density of squirrel, and in this case, we could be sure that it was matching it because we were able to validate the index by counting, well, estimating the, the numbers and then removing all the squirrels from, from a woodland. So that was a, a very important achievement. It was important also because uh, when somebody goes to, to a woodland or to any area that they want to, where they want to reduce squirrels from, uh, they can use this index to estimate how many squirrels are in the area so they can plan the effort. And they can also use the index if they use either culling or fertility control to see what the effect of intervention was. So they can use the index to start with, then they apply culling or fertility control or both. And then they use this index again to see whether it's matching the number of squirrels that were taken out of the system through, through culling or they were affected by contraception. And then, as I was describing, we are uh, still working on minimizing bait uptake by non-target species. So far, so good. We didn't have uh, any non-target species apart from a single mouse. Obviously, in everybody's mind, the red squirrel is possibly the most important non-target species. And that's why we are planning to do more work this year on this. Next slide, please. So future steps on, on this side of the project, we would like to train volunteers to use our camera trap index. Uh, we would like to test the feeders in areas with gray squirrels, and we would be very grateful for the help of volunteers to estimate the effort involved in squirrel control. We would like also to collect data through the volunteers to look at squirrel movements and to estimate if you put contraceptives in, in an area, what is the, your sphere of intervention? So if you put um, contraceptives in a 
15 hectare wood, are you actually affecting only those 15 hectares or are you affecting uh, an area around those 15 hectares? And then we would like to use the camera trap index on a pit tagged population of red squirrels to validate whether we can use that uh, index on, on red squirrels too. In addition, uh, we would like to continue to use the model. I haven't put this as a, as a uh, point, but it's important to reflect and to continue Simon's work. Um, this will be likely done with uh, funding kindly provided by DEFRA. DEFRA has been the main body that has provided the funding for the model development and to ensure mainly that we can plan interventions at a large scale. Next slide, please. So I think what remains for me to say is to thank all the collaborators and the volunteers, to thank my colleagues, the one that gave a talk in particular, but also the many other colleagues that are working, the unsung heroes that are working on the field with us and all the collaborators and volunteers that were too many to be mentioned here. And obviously, thank you so much to the Accord because we could not have done this without the support. That's wonderful. Thank you ever so much, Giovanna. Um, and thank you to you and all of your team for this, this work. It's so very important. So we'll start with the questions, and there's been a lot of questions, um, but I just want to echo um, what everyone said about thanking collaborators and donators, then um, without you, this, this couldn't go on. Um, so in terms of progress, are you where you thought you'd be at the midpoint? And if not, can you catch up? So are we where we thought we'd be in the research? Yes, I can take, I can take this, Kay. So six months ago, I would have said no. Now I would say yes, definitely. Yeah, COVID didn't help, did it? But uh, but now we're back on track. <laughs> yeah, so COVID didn't help. And also the whole project started on a concept that had worked. And then for some reason that nobody could explain, including our main collaborators in the States, that particular concept didn't work and we couldn't explain it. So we're a bit, um depressed mm -hmm. but then this happened we have put a lot of effort and in fact i would be as bold as saying we are a bit further than what we wanted to be because we now have certainly two possibly three oral contraceptive that if i was a millionaire i would take forward <laughs> brilliant thanks very much Giovanna. maybe you'll win the lottery um, as squirrels often hoard food, how do we ensure that contraceptive does not get into small mammal populations, which are very important in ecosystems, Sarah? <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, so um, the bait we've been using so far is uh, hazelnut paste because it's easy to get hold of and squirrels absolutely love it. Um, but we also chose it because it's got a very suitable consistency to put into a hopper and it's actually very difficult for the schools to remove it and cache it in the environment. So as I mentioned in my talk, we've seen very little spillage around uh, the, the, the hoppers and our cameras show that the schools actually eat them on site at the hopper entrance rather than actually going away and stashing it. So we'd want a contraceptive to be like a thick liquid, so it was very difficult for them to do that. Uh, brilliant. And we've had a few people coming up, Sarah, as, as you're here, um, talking about pine mm -hmm. martins and the concern around pine martins being able to access the hoppers as they're quite large, you know, um, uh, strong mammals. Yes. Um, yeah, so we're, we're very aware that pine martins are probably the most challenging non-target other than red squirrels to actually keep out of our hoppers. Now, so far, we've only conducted trials in Yorkshire because that's local and it's more cost effective for us to do it. And there's a lot of squirrels in Yorkshire. Uh, we've also done trials in North Wales, but we've never done trials where there's pine martens. Now, realistically, uh, where we'd want to deploy the contraceptive, the majority of grey squirrel areas don't actually have pine martens. However, we're not going to ignore them as a non-target. Um, 
As I mentioned, we are interested in looking at more sophisticated technology to exclude animals such as pine martens and lead squirrels, which is actually looking at uh, color sensors. Uh, so we have preliminary data that shows um, if you scan in the blue region of light, uh, gray squirrels have uh, a much stronger blue reading than uh, red squirrels or presumably pine martens as well. Uh, so it's that's research is very much in its infancy, but we have some promising results to kind of work on there. That's great. So th that answers the question, will the colour sensors pick up subtle colour differences with the greys with reddish fur and reds with greyish fur? Um, yeah, so um, the, the, the aim of this trial this year is to take as many scans of red squirrels. So we're going to deploy hoppers in uh, Cumbria and Northumberland with the help of volunteer groups. Uh, we'll scan as many squirrel coats as possible um, and we'll do the same with grey squirrels and we'll see. But um, as I said, initially we found that there is a sufficient difference if you take average readings across the scan. Um, so we'll be looking at kind of the shoulder areas as uh, the hopper will uh, scan the squirrel and then it, when it gets a sufficient level of blue uh, resonance, then it will open up the door. That's the idea anyway, that's the theory. Okay, and will, will, the, will, it, will, it, will it be impacted by seasonal changes in coat colour at all? That's another. Um, again, we'll have to gather data on yeah. that to, to make sure, yeah. Thank you. Um, looking at knock-on impacts, um, people are concerned, what is the risk of the fertility treatments working their way up the food chain through predation or decomposition? So could either the oral contraceptives, the vaccine contraceptive or the diazocon impact the food chain if, if grey squirrels were predated on or decomposed? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll take that one. Um, so it's slightly different between the tracks of our research. So the vaccine itself, we're not very worried about this issue at all. Um, the vaccine itself, it's unlikely that any predators of the squirrels um, would actually be affected by the contraceptive at all. And obviously seeing as the squirrels might need multiple doses, um, any predator would need a larger number of multiple doses as well. So this isn't something that particularly concerns us, but as obviously as part of the registration package, we will need to look at knock-on effects and any cascade through the food chain to make sure that this is this is fully studied and um, doesn't give any effects. Diazocon will be slightly different. Um, as a chemical, it is possible that this could cascade, but obviously this is something that we're going to be looking at during the course of our research to make sure we've got the, the least amount of risk possible. Thank you. <clears throat> and Bex, is it possible to administer this via injection? And I know you've spoken about it a little bit in your um, in your presentation. Yeah, so we, we do have injectable uh, vaccines possible. Um, so uh, one of the vaccines is registered in the US, but not in the UK. Um, obviously for squirrels, it would be very, very difficult to achieve a, a large scale injectable uh, vaccine program um, the, the cost involves would be would be very large um, especially with the vaccine and it wouldn't be legally able to be administered at the moment you'd still have to go through the same registration process that we were going to have to do for the for the oral vaccination so um, ideally you'd need something like an oral the, the effort is going to be much much lower and, and the cost is likely to be lower as well. Thank you we had a lot of people um calling, uh, writing in, uh, asking how they can participate. And I just want to thank all those that expressed interest in being involved in this work. And at present, we are in the research project phase and all activities have been planned up until September 2023. So, but after this, we will need to conduct the landscape scale field trials that the team have been talking about and outlined. And this offers opportunities to get involved and support the registration phase. So uh, uh, at this time, no, but in the future, yes, <laughs> I think. Would you agree, Giovanna? Yeah. Great. Yes, yes, thank you very much, Kay. That, that's exactly the point. We. We have had a lot of kind offers of 
of land, woodlands, uh, gardens, you, you name it, which is brilliant, which obviously shows interest for this. But we, and, and as you said, we will take this forward when and if we, we can do it. It will take some time before we, we can take up these offers. Yes, definitely. Um, in terms of behaviour, does contraception affect copulation? Was a question that came in. So there should be no copulation. Uh, the contraceptive that have been used so far, the injectable ones, uh, typically gonacon, that is a gonadotropin releasing hormone vaccine, so knocks off the master hormone that induces the cascade of um, sex hormones in males and females, uh, prevents animal for, from uh, cycling, uh, prevents the production of sperm in, in males and so on. Uh, so, or, or testosterone more than sperm. So, no, they should not copulate. They should stay. What, what the inventor of, of Gonagon used to say is that animals are normally in a non reproductive status throughout most of the year, and they should stay so if contraceptive. Brilliant. Um, somebody says, can it work on a landscape scale? And if you, uh, and also if you uh, start fertility control and then stop, how would that impact uh, any management? Simon, are you in? Yes, I'm still here. Hi, Simon. Um, <laughs> hiya. You're so, uh, yeah, I mean, the modelling has shown that provided we can manage to um, target sufficient proportion of the population and then obviously make those uh, uh, deliver the contraceptive and then obviously that contraceptive then makes individuals infertile, then um, yes, they obviously can work on a landscape scale. Um, if you obviously with any treatment, if you if you stop um, that treatment before um, you eradicate the population, then um, you'll inevitably get some bounce back. With um, fertility control, because um, potentially the effects of the drug might last long, uh, a few years, potentially, Giovanna, mm -hmm. they will cer certainly have yeah. ongoing yeah. impacts. Yeah. Then that, that recovery will be um, potentially slower and certainly slower than it would be if you were trapping and then stopped. Brilliant. Thank Is there you. anything else you'd like to add, Jim? No? Um, no, just to add that whenever we did, and this must be the experience of, of many listeners, whenever we did our trials in various woodlands in Yorkshire, uh, occasionally we would go back weeks after we believe we had removed all the squirrels and the squirrels were back. So clearly, obviously, that's why we're talking about landscape scale, but reinvasion is very, very quick when you call. Mm. Great. We've yeah, still got yeah. some, uh, we've still got some questions about, Kate. oh, sorry. Uh, um, Sarah was wanting to add something. Yes. Um, yeah, in terms of kind of the amount of effort to deliver over landscape scale, um, we would hope to engage, uh, obviously, engage with volunteer groups to help us to deliver it over um, that kind of area. And the thing with volunteers, as, as Giovanna mentioned before, is uh, we're hoping as the uh, bait can be delivered in an easier and more um, acceptable may way maybe than, than culling can be done traditionally, we would hope to engage more volunteer groups and have a greater effort to deliver it on a landscape scale if that makes sense um, because when I've worked in with volunteers um, we found that it's much more easy to recruit volunteers to bait hoppers than it is to actually uh, check and, and traps and dispatch squirrels and the amount of effort required uh, is, is much smaller as well for the hoppers. I probably um, could add to that, Kay, just to say, I, I suppose the um, the success of control at a landscape scale is is obviously based on um, 
coordination and, and having enough uptake <clears throat> and enough people to be able to, to actually deliver the contraceptives. That is um, an aspect of the model that we haven't looked at yet. So we've been assuming that um, fertility control or, or in fact any management can be applied in all woodlands. Um, one of the next steps for the model we're hoping to do is start to look at um, exactly what the levels of um, cooperation and coordination you might need um, in order to be able to, to maintain um, or, or to maintain low densities of squirrels uh, at a landscape. Yeah, brilliant. And uh, somebody said, how are you going to get permission from private landowners to operate at a landscape scale? I think the UK Squirrel Accord in itself is a partnership of many conservation and forestry organisations and companies, but the, we are also in connection, connecting to private individuals um, and forestry and landowners um, to make them aware of the fertility control uh, project and the issue. And there are a lot of people, there are lots of large landowners already involved and collaborating and supporting this work because of the concerns over uh, red squirrel survival and tree health. Um, Sarah, there was another question for you about cameras. What, what, what wildlife cameras are you using uh, in to take in the field research? Um, so, so in order to get the accurate results, we have we've had to use uh, top of the range wildlife cameras. So we always uh, purchase Reconyx cameras. Uh, we, we realize they are very expensive, but there's a reason for it. They're very robust. You can put them out in the field for weeks um, and not have to check them. And they're very responsive. The, the, the trigger time is very quick as well. So um, that's a, a plug for Reconyx. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Could you use hair tubes instead of cameras to estimate the squirrel density? Um, to be honest, uh, we based our camera method on a previous method that one of my colleagues, uh, ex-colleagues, Mark Lambert, actually developed for estimating rats on farms. So it was based on some good research already. And that's why we went down the camera route, because we already thought there was a good chance it would work effectively. In terms of hair samples, um, I'm afraid I haven't actually looked into it that because the camera method has worked so well so far. Um, but I guess there is a potential there, but we've just not looked at it at the moment. Yeah. Um, in terms of implementing the hoppers, in, uh, people are concerned about uh, delivery in towns and cities as they need to be priority areas as their reservoirs for grey squirrels spreading back into uh, urban areas, uh, uh, woodlands from urban areas. So, um, do you see, do we see the hopper? I mean, essentially, the fertility control is a more acceptable method of um, managing grey squirrels and I think we see it as uh, a way that uh, individuals can more get involved in this, can't, don't we? So that people might be able to have it in their gardens uh, and be able to yeah, yeah. put it in areas. So yeah, the, the hopper's device, obviously, as Giovanna mentioned, this is currently in its form a research tool. Um, so we'd want a more simplistic design, um, yeah, that people could uh, distribute wherever they liked, basically, as long as obviously the, the, the bait was protected and secure and people were aware that, you know, they shouldn't be touched, then um, yes, uh, they should be able to be used by the majority of people. Um, there's a questions about uh, masting and mast years and how mast years might impact grey squirrel populations and therefore impact our work. Is that Simon? Uh, Simon. <laughs> Sorry, just got to turn everything back on again. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms time. of the mod, yeah, I, mean, I could <laughs> do, yeah, but I don't want to inflict my face on everybody for a long period of time. <laughs> um, the, um, yeah, it's not something we've looked at in 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 the models so far. Obviously, um, we are aware that um, dependent on mass like masting um, densities of squirrels can quite um, radically change. Um, I think. 
the part of the reason why we haven't looked at this in detail at the moment is just because there isn't I think sufficient understanding of um, to be able to predict mass year and understand all of the particular drivers um, behind it so it's kind of difficult for us to incorporate uh, from what what I've understood um, in mass thing that it, it tends to act um, there is a degree of synchronicity across a landscape but it tends to be um, relatively localized and so what we've assumed so far is that um, any local changes will be aggregated out across the whole landscape um, in terms of uh, in terms of squirrel movements and everything else. So we will achieve eradication at the same time. But it's certainly something that we um, has come up um, and, and more so recently. And so our plan is to start to look at um, at least simulating the kind of factors that um, uh, so simulating masting, so looking at different, um, uh, creating our woodlands with different patterns for masting, which therefore then knocks on to squirrel density. Um, what I would say is all, all of the um, mechanisms that we have in our model currently are density dependent. So there's certainly the capability for our model to be able to accommodate this. It's just about um, looking at it. Uh, in terms of potential impacts, so like I said, we, we're hoping that or well, we're assuming that there won't be any impact on our on our conclusions. But if there are, um, obviously we've seen that um, you can compensate for higher or lower squirrel densities by changing the number of hoppers or traps that you put into the environment. Um, and so if we do find that there is a significant difference, then what that means is we just need to um, go back to looking at more local scales rather than landscape scales um, to be able to advise for instance, how many hoppers you might want to put in a particular woodland. Um, and using Sarah's um, camera index, density camera index, that should be relatively straightforward to be able to measure the density of squirrels and then to come up with a number of hoppers um, that, that would work in that particular woodland, for instance. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Simon. Um, there are points being still being raised about the pine martin. Um, the pine martin may well recover and hopefully will recover in uh, across the UK, but uh, at the same time, it's unlikely to uh, live in urban environments and it's urban environments that have huge populations of grey squirrels. And there was a study by Queen's uh, University Belfast uh, that came out last year that raised this as an issue and raised them at the gray, the urban environments of reservoirs for grey squirrels and that they may over time evolve to uh, know that the to evolve uh, as the red squirrel did to know that the pine martin is a predator and for their for them to be less of an impact for the pine martin to have less of an impact on the grey squirrel and then the grey squirrels are then come out again uh, into the landscape. I think at the same time, you know, the pine martin is have is is, pos is positive news in in many areas, but but it will take a long time for pine martins to recover because of their slow breeding. Yeah, can I just add to that? Case? Yes, so of course. We're we're not kind of saying that um, we're ignoring the the pine martin at the moment either. I, I think uh, obviously with the current uh, project timeline and funding we wanted to look at the most common species that are likely to try and access hoppers at the moment and then look at specifically red squirrels because obviously they're very important too uh, but we do have plans um, in the coming years to actually test our hoppers with pine martins and refine them further to try and keep pine martins out. Yeah, and for a lot of successful invasive species eradications, it takes a three pronged approach. So if you had the, you know, culling, if it's still going on fertility control and pine martins at the same time, there is a potential um, to remove the gray squirrel uh, from the UK for the benefit of the red squirrel and for broadleaf tree health. And somebody raised the question of why, why are gray squirrels such a problem um, is new to this. Um, so gray squirrels outcompete red squirrels for food and habitat. They also uh, carry squirrel pox virus, um, which is deadly to reds, but not grays, but they also uh, buy Bark strip the broadleaf trees, um, both native and non-native. Uh, important ecologically and economically important broadleaf species like our oak trees that support more species than any other 
tree we have in the UK um, and the bark stripping can be detrimental to the value of that tree but it can also be detrimental to the health of that tree um, and they bark strip trees from 10 to 50 years old and um, at a time when the country is trying to plant more broadleaf trees and trees in general for biodiversity and uh, ecosystem surface benefits um, this is a real issue and um, for landowners who are planting trees when grey squirrels come in and decimate their, their trees um, and you get that loss of that ecological loss uh, and then for, for foresters it's the, an economic loss as well. And the RFS published a report, if you go on uh, their website, uh, about the economic costs uh, of grey squirrels recently. Um, so back to the questions. Um, in terms of putting out the bait, would you just do it, would, you, would it be a year round? Would putting the oral contraceptive be putting it out year round or would you just put it out around the breeding seasons, Bex? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll take that one. Um, so when we're looking at the efficacy of the contraceptive, we're also looking at uh, the length of time it's effective for. So when we're looking at things like the vaccine, hopefully we can get to a stage where we've got a vaccine that is effective for a long period of time. So in theory, you wouldn't need to put it out all year round. There might be certain sort of short periods that you can put the contraceptive out for, whether it's just before the breeding seasons, sort of once a year, twice a year. Um, it's obviously gonna depend on the type of contraceptive that, that we end up with and, and the efficacy of that contraceptive. But it's unlikely that it's gonna be something that has to be delivered all year round. It will be sort of specific delivery times that, that you, would, you would be able to aim for. Great. How long is the contraceptive effective in an individual squirrel? And no doses and efficacy is something you're looking at at the moment. Yeah, so that's that's definitely something we need to look further into. Um, ideally, it would be effective for at least 12 months, but we need to do a lot more research into the contraceptive formulations and work out exactly how long these contraceptives are going to last for. Is there a danger of breeding a grey population that is resistant to the immunocontraceptive? Could they become resistant to this at some point? So this, this question comes up regularly whenever we talk about contraceptive for wildlife in general. And uh, my answer to this is that I haven't yet seen any population that has become resistant to contraceptive. So it, it's, it's a good question, but I, I haven't seen any evidence so far. If the evidence mounted up, it would be interesting. But that's why also would be very important to have a mixture of um, methods. So culling and fertility control or and a mixture of contraceptives, for instance, vaccine and diazepam. Thank you. Uh, on to the best bait choice. Uh, how did we land on the hazelnut paste? Did you try other things? Keen to know whether something like Nutella has been tested. <laughs> but, uh, and is it better, <laughs> better than peanut butter? <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we did, at the very start of the trials, we, we did um, some bait trials on our captive squirrels because it was easier to use them. Uh, and we tried, uh, uh, we tried peanut butter, we tried hazelnut paste, we tried like jam as well and, and other kind of attractive substances. Um, and, and basically the hazelnut paste was by far the most attractive to our captive squirrels. And going into the field, it looks like it's very attractive to, to wild squirrels as well. So um, we, we just chose it because we needed something that was fairly cost effective, but very attractive and also the right kind of bait consistency so we couldn't use solid food because uh, uh, it's just easier to mix in bait markers and, and, and other substances and chemicals and stuff like that. Mm. Um, will yeah, evolution just, produce squirrels that avoid that. traps and bait stations? Did you find that the traps and bait stations have been avoided already in, in, in uh, by squirrels getting used to them or being yeah. scared of them? Yep. Sorry, I'll just add a little bit onto the, the oh, last yeah, question about um, bait types. So obviously we, we've been running with 
hazelnut paste for the trials that we've been we've been conducting at the moment. But obviously, once we get um, a effective formulation that, that we can try, what we want to do is having a look at different bait types um, to try and see if we can refine the bait types and if there's anything else that that works with the, with the contraceptive itself to see if we, we don't have to stick to something like hazelnut paste. We, we will try a variety of options as we're moving forward. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Kay, could you repeat that uh, question again? I can't remember which question it was now, sorry. <laughs> I was looking at so many different It's about traps and hoppers. <laughs> oh, well, the, well, uh, thank you. Sorry, I'm reading all of the questions at the moment. So, surely evolution will produce squirrels that avoid traps and bait stations. And um, have, have any of the squirrels at the moment um, avoided the bait stations and the hoppers or been scared of them? Well, certainly, uh, I don't think there's any evidence um, from the many, many years of trapping that schools. I, I don't know, maybe uh, practitioners have more information. But certainly with hoppers, the good thing about hoppers is it's a positive experience for the squirrels. So they go in and they get a tasty treat. There's no negative impacts on them. So there's no real reason why they should, uh, you know, we will ensure that the contraceptive does not have any negative welfare impacts, but so they should keep on going to the hoppers because they have no reason not to. Mm, somebody says they have evidence of hopper shy red squirrels in Northumberland, uh, which is interesting. So hoppers? Hopper shy red squirrels in Northumberland. All uh, right, well, I have heard that actually red squirrels are less likely to use feeding stations with we've just not found that with gray schools we had that one word where we had low bait uptake so two words with low bait uptake but i think that was more to do with other factors rather than the schools themselves um and yeah so we, we've had no evidence so far um but yeah we want to do bigger wider scale trials in in different areas to see uh, if if maybe Yorkshire squirrels just really love hoppers, so <laughs> so we'd like to try them in different areas to to see. Maybe red squirrels generally are just a bit more wary <laughs> of things. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a quick, yeah, sorry, Joe Uh I wonder whether Sarah can comment quickly about the fact that even when squirrels would have what you would imagine is a bad experience being trapped, anesthetized and microchipped, which we, we did in a few woods. Uh, Sarah can comment about the fact that the following day they were back. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, with our microchip squirrels, uh, we actually, we trapped, we had to anesthetize them in order to microchip them. Uh, and, then we released them and when we put the hoppers out, over 90% of the schools we microchipped just went straight into the hoppers within the first couple of days of us putting them out. And then subsequently right at the end of the study when we trapped to remove the schools, they went back into the tracks and we removed all of our microchip schools bar two, I think out of 51. So we have no evidence at the moment that they are deterred from hoppers or traps. Thank you. Uh, Simon, one for you for the modelling. Um, I understand modelling to account for masting, but can the model also be adapted to exploit physical barriers such as the coast, hills and large rivers? Um, <clears throat> yes, it, it could be in theory. Um, so we could. So our, our current landscape is abstracted from um, we, we started out at the beginning of this project wanting to understand um, how we might be able to create our virtual landscape uh, similar to the real world. Um, so we've always looked to abstract from, um, from real data. There are aspects of that that, that could be put in. Um, so, for instance, where there are very clear barriers, like, uh, for instance, the River Severn, um, we wouldn't expect squirrels to cross. It becomes a little bit more tricky when we're talking about um, resolutions like, for instance, a, um, you know, a medium-sized river, for instance. We don't necessarily have the data to support 
um, looking at that as a physical or knowing whether that's a physical barrier or not, because we don't have information about overhang of tree canopies and, and things like that to see whether actually it is stopping squirrels or not. Um, I think ultimately what we're, we're starting to lean towards is understanding that um, there are actually, other than the really obvious big barriers, relatively few barriers that prevent squirrels from moving through the landscape. Um, so there's always be a hedgerow or, you know, even a bridge or, or something like that, which allows squirrels to move from one, one woodland to another. Um, but we, we obviously try and account for it as best we can in the model with the information that we have. Um, yes, or cars, I suppose. I think, is that, is that relating to this? I haven't seen squirrels traveling on cars, but um, if you're telling me it happens, then uh, yep, I'll take your word for it. Um, also, while you've got you, Simon, um, what assumption do APHA Simon's modeling efforts make with regards to the ubiquitous relationship between density and performance, which invariably makes eradication and sustained reduction difficult? When density is reduced, remaining squirrels will perform better, produce more surviving offspring. This compensation will affect all prediction on time to eradication control. So absolute values on numbers of years are rather meaningless when considering this, as well as the influence of masting that is likely to be particularly large for a program centered on reducing fertility. Long question, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so we don't, um, yeah, no, I, I think I think I've got the gist of it is, is basically what, what density dependent functions do you have in your, in your model? So, um, I mean, in terms of, um, you know, squirrel fecundity survival, um, we actually assumed a, a, a relative worst case that actually um, the, the squirrels perform um, at their maximum capacity until they hit um, a limiting number, a limiting density in each woodland, at which point um, you end up with um, additional excess mortality because the, the woodland can't uh, support that number of squirrels. Um, so obviously, as we're as we're reducing the numbers of squirrels, the um, the numbers are already fighting against us. Um, in theory, there'd be a, a more asymptotic relationship. So actually, there'd be a slowdown as we move towards our kind of carrying capacity. Um, but actually, our model um, doesn't take this into account already. We're, we're already operating on this um, kind of worst case. So the numbers that we are um, outputting, I think. Um, could potentially be argued that they are a conservative estimate. Um, if there is, I mean, if anybody is obviously aware of data on um, how fecundity and um, like the actual numbers of how fecundity and survival um, change with density, then that, that would obviously be useful and I'd be interested to hear. So we can try and uh, incorporate it more explicitly in our model. Thank you. How did you calculate the carrying capacity, I'll add something. Simon? Oh, sorry. Uh, Simon, I, I was wondering whether you can also comment on the fact that all these comments are equally true for culling. Am I right? Yeah, both. Both. Um, I mean, both management um, options have a density. Depend obviously, work um, differently dependent on your density. So you'll get um, better efficacy or things will take longer if you have a high density. So yes, it, it works in both ways, slightly differently, but um, it, it does work in both, both ways. Thanks, Simon. Uh, how did you calculate the carrying capacity? So carrying capacity in the model isn't, isn't your traditional carrying capacity. You might think of an absolute limit, um, but it is the point at which we would assume that um, survival equals mortality. But that, that's taken largely from um, all the density estimates that we could get our hands on, looking at different um, in each of the different um, types of woodlands and um, combining that together to give us a, um, a num an average number of squirrels per um, well, per kilometre of a certain type of woodland. And then we then applied this to the data that we had um, in order to calculate the, the total number for a particular woodland. Thanks. And has the modelling looked at the effects of squirrels moving into cleared woods from surrounding areas? So it, it hasn't, it hasn't. So if woods remain, um, it's like nearby woods are cleared in a particular year and um, don't have... Um, 
any so that there, there's local eradication in those woodlands then in theory yes we have um we have looked at the effects of then squirrels moving in from nearby populated woodlands um but not at the same time scales that you perhaps might be talking about in the field so that that's our next objective is to change how often the model um, updates its populations and looks at um, control from uh, an annual clearance to um, a weekly clearance, monthly or weekly clearance. I think we're aiming for weekly, but I'll have to check. Um, so we can look more at, um, at that kind of um, factor and to start to look at uh, applying what might happen if we apply uh, different control schedules in different woodlands. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, can anyone tell and um, how long a squirrel lives for? Bex. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll take that one. Um, so at the moment in, in the field uh, with wild squirrels, we'd expect it to be somewhere up for about five years. In, in captivity, it's, it's a lot longer, but um, yeah, we're, we're looking at quite a short lifespan for squirrels. So if we look at contraceptives that may last for one or two years, um, if we can get it to last up to four years, that might be the entire lifetime of a squirrel. But um, yeah, it, it's about three to five years we expect at the moment. Great, thanks, Bex. And uh, can Sarah, can you explain what pit tagged means, please? Um, sorry, so... Uh... Pit tagging and microchipping are essentially the same things. A pit tag is just a type of microchip. So, yeah. Somebody asked any uh, So, um, oh, sorry. If, for people who don't understand what microchipping is, sorry, I just, <laughs> I know some people might not understand that as well. So obviously it's the same kind of, it's exactly the same kind of microchip that you would put in your cats or dogs. Uh, uh, to, to tag them. So it's an inert tag that when it moves through um, a certain frequency in a, in a coil, it uh, resonates uh, and gives a precise individual identity. Um, so our hoppers have these RFID um, systems that will record the date and time that the, that identity is attained, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And have you had any stoats or weasels trying to access the the feeding hoppers? Um, so yes, strangely enough, um, I actually expected there to be uh, more stoats. Uh, we haven't seen any weasels at all on our cameras. Uh, we've seen stoats on our bait piles when we've been doing our camera method. Uh, but we haven't actually seen a stoat at all around the hoppers, which I found actually quite unusual because I know uh, we've actually um, on the odd occasion caught a stoat in our squirrel traps as well. So we know they're in the area, but they just don't seem to be interested in our hoppers at all. And I don't know why that is. Maybe other people would have more of an idea. Mm, thank you. Does the type of ecosystem or habitat have an impact on the grey squirrels eating the contraception? Might it be different in woodlands versus um, gardens, urban versus rural? Mm. Um, yes, so, yeah. um, so, so far, uh, obviously woodland is our most important habitat to target at the moment. So we focus purely on woodlands. We've looked at broadleaf woodlands and coniferous woodlands, um, and we've got very good results in both. We've now started to look at areas of managed uh, woodland, like um, parkland, for example, to see how the bait uptake will look there. Uh, we haven't yet got any results to share with you yet in, in that respect. Uh, but the plan is, yes, we will look at other environments. We just wanted to uh, prove uh, the concept in woodlands first as that's the most important habitat we're looking at yeah and do you think there might be an issue in farmland where they have as you showed um on on, on the picture on one of your slides um uh, quite a lot of food resource there um yeah so a lot of our woodlands um are surrounded by farmland uh that they're, they're fairly remote uh fairly isolated because uh, the, the studies are just easier to manage in woodlands like that. And as Giovanna mentioned before, they're also kind of, um, they range from six hectares up to 18 hectares. So 
Uh, but again, we're going to look at uh, bigger areas of woodland and more connected areas of woodland um, to test the, the, the theory, the, the methods. Um, in terms of other environments, I would expect bait uptake to be very good in urban environments because uh, from what we've seen, uh, urban schools are more opportunistic and uh, I, I believe that, well, anyone who has a bird feeder in their garden will know they'll readily feed from anything you put out there. Even if it's squirrel proof, they'll find some way of getting in there. So uh, certainly in urban environments, we would expect very good uptake. Yeah. Have we already, or are you planning to look at bait delivery in woodlands managed for pheasants where plentiful alternative food resources may exist year round? Um, so at the moment we've looked at deployment in winter. Uh, actually some of our woods have been part of estates and there has been presence in the wood. And it means that they've actually disrupted our camera study because we had to put a lot more bait down on the floor to ensure that the pheasants didn't get at it. In terms of the hoppers, the pheasants have been around the hoppers but they, they haven't been able to access them at all. Um, in terms of the food availability to the squirrels, uh, yes, in winter, um, when we've deployed, as you've seen, we've got very good bait uptake, even in areas where there's pheasants and, and farmland. And this is a very good time of year to deliver the contraceptive as it's immediately prior to the main, uh, the, the first breeding season of the year. So uh, we, we don't really at the moment have any reason to think that uh, pheasant hoppers would have any effect of bait uptake. Yeah. Um... So bearing in mind the production of these hoppers will have to for, be from specific specifications to work and they're quite complex, aren't they? Uh, would it be possible or practical for volunteers to request drawings and help produce the hoppers themselves? Uh, to actually produce them? Mm. To, um, In the future? So I don't know, by 3D printing is, or, uh, we um, well, they're metal at the moment, aren't they? So. <laughs> Well, at the moment, like I said, because uh, they're a research tool and they have complex electronics in them, like the microchip reader and the bait weighing devices, uh, the, the insert is actually uh, 3D printed plastic. Hmm. Uh, so we have a manufacturer, Nature Counters, who sell uh, similar devices online. And, and basically these hoppers uh, are purely for our research. We will take the specifications uh, that we need, such as the angle of the door, the, the weights on the door that we find are the most optimum for allowing gray squirrels in, but keeping everything else out. And we can provide those specifications, but we would have to look at ensuring that any hopper would protect the bait from non-targets. So there will be kind of, um, yeah, strict uh, like <laughs> specifications. Uh, specifications from the hoppers mm. to ensure that. Uh, mm. So it depends how well people could ensure that they could follow those specifications. Uh, but this is something we need to work on. Um, at the moment, we're focusing on our research tool. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Simon, another one for you. Uh, I hope you haven't already answered this. Does the movement of squirrels into and out of a woodland impact the modelling and efficacy of the contraceptive? Um, so the move, inherently it will on, on the basis that, you know, you have, um, you're not, it, it will potentially reduce the, um, the proportion of squirrels that you're maintaining with a certain, um, with the with the contraceptive so it'll dilute your effort in a way we do account for it in the model though so we do have squirrel movements um moving you know moving around the landscape as and when so from high density areas to low density areas in general um and that doesn't seem well we haven't tested it without that to know what the impact is um only that um but, but it is it is incorporated in our predictions um yes hey okay can you hear me yes uh, i think we said i want to, to add something to this um yes yeah, so as part of our studies we have looked at uh preliminary data on movements by squirrels into and out of baited areas so for example when we conducted our trial in uh, north wales with volunteers uh we had a 28 hectare area of woodland 
and we split it in two. And in 14 hectares, we deployed our hoppers with bait marker, and that's where we got 71% bait uptake. We also removed squirrels from across the other half of the wood to see how much movement there was by squirrels into and out of um, those areas. And we only found that six squirrels had moved over into the uh, non-baited uh, area. So our contraceptive is very targeted, uh, which means it's easier to manage, but we have to kind of be mindful that, um, uh, I mean, this is based on an initial study, just one woodland, but it looks like uh, there's little effect on the surrounding areas, if that makes sense. Thank you. When will you be sharing your squirrel density index methodology? Um, it'd be great to use in, wood, in, in woods where they're already managing gray squirrels. Uh, so as part of our uh, DEFRA objectives this year, uh, we agreed we would actually turn the index into a practical tool. Uh, so there'll be like an instruction manual and then a, a kind of a, an Excel spreadsheet where they can input data and it will just churn out a result. Uh, I mean, we have tested this on, on 10 woodlands so far and the results are very good, but I'd be really interested to gather more data as more and more people use it. Um, in Wales this year, again, we have, we're continuing with the project over there and we're hoping to test the theory on much bigger areas of woodland and more connected areas of woodland where squirrel movements are going to affect the method more. Um, so I'm very happy to, uh, once we have it in a nice package to share it with people, if they would like to try it out and we could maybe uh, incorporate it at some point into um, looking at how accurate it is as a method. Uh, can, can I add something? Kate? Yes. Kate, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, so the, the big caveat to what Sarah was saying is that if anybody's interested, obviously, we will be very willing to collaborate with whoever is interested in using the density index. But for us to have one dot on, on the graph that is meaningful, people must be committed not only to use it, but also to remove the vast majority of squirrel from, from an area so that we can validate the, the index. Thank you. And is there a best scientific paper on gray ranging behavior? Sorry, what, what, can you is there, that, is there a good scientific paper on the ranging of grey squirrels? Oh, um, from extensive searching, I haven't found any decent research on ranging behaviours. So um, I most of the ranging behaviour I have looked at is from uh, Craig Shuttleworth's grey squirrel book, if people know that. Um, so there's a chapter on ranging behavior there, uh, but there are very few studies because basically uh, in the past, people have uh, radio collared squirrels, but you can only radio collar so many. So you don't really get a good feel for population level movement. And it's actually a very difficult thing to estimate. Um, so we're continuously gathering, gathering data, for example, for one of our DEFRA studies, we looked at recolonization. So we removed squirrels from three woods and we looked at how quickly it took for squirrels to actually recolonize those woods. Um, so all of this kind of empirical data is being fed back into our model to make it as accurate as it can be. Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> there was a question on, uh, well, joy on the, the this greater governmental commitment um, and any thoughts on devolved government barriers um, and just to say that um, grey squirrels are an issue in all four of the UK countries um, and the government agencies are signatories to the UK squirrel accord because they recognize the problem with grey squirrels so I don't see there being a barrier because they are already involved which is fantastic. Um, I think really that's most of the 
most of the key questions and I know we've all been here for quite a long time so is there anything that Simon, Bex, Giovanna or Sarah you want to just say um, before we go? Anything, any final words or final comments? Just say thank you for being here. Thank you to the team that, as I said, is, is much wider than what you saw today uh, and is also in different countries. Uh, we are part of an international effort. Uh, several organizations are working on fertility control for wildlife. Uh, and I say this because uh, we keep saying if something came up from another group that is much more promising than what we are doing, we wouldn't have any problem in testing it tomorrow. So thanks also very, very much to Kay that is doing a fantastic job and to the Accord for supporting us in this big effort. Yeah, I just want to echo that. Thank you very much to you, all, all four of you here today and, and the rest of the team behind you um, and to everybody that's collaborated so far and everybody that's supported either time, energy or by donating uh, money, we are still fundraising to finish this research and appreciate any and all donations. Thank you very much everybody for today. Thank you again to all of our speakers and um, we hope to see you again in the future for more exciting updates. <laughs>